This is an intro. Intro, intro, intro. Hustle and flow chart with your boy, my boy, Matt Wolf, and Joe Fit. Hey. Yo. Oh, you jerk. Yeah. yeah. Had to jump in there and get ahead of me again. I don't think I don't think these listeners realize how fun it is to uh, beat you to the mic. Yeah. He thinks he's being so sly with his recording button, but he's not. I was trying to catch Joe off guard and, and start recording our intro, but it didn't work. It's all good. Welcome to the Hustle and Flow Chart Podcast. That's my line. I know. I'm just stealing <laughs> everything right now. I'm on a roll. <laughs> I'm Matt Wolf, and that is Joe Fear. That's right. And together we make... Biz Bros. Joma? Is that, that's what Sterling calls us, that's right? That's what Joma. Bob Sterling does call us. Joma. Joma. Together we are Joma. He also calls me his uh, bird apprentice. So <laughs> we have many names. <laughs> uh, it's just yes. fun. It's Joe just fun. So what the heck? feathery friends. I do. I'm fascinated by birds. I'm reading a book about Leonardo da Vinci right now, and he loves birds as well. So I'm in good company. Okay. That's a true story. <laughs> true story. All right, Matt. So what are we It was so about? unbelievable. I would have never known that. <laughs> uh, no, it was more not believing I'm reading like a 500-page Leonardo da Vinci Oh, I believe book. you're reading it. Do I believe you're going to finish it? That's a different story. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I've ever finished a book that long. So, uh, But, you know, our guest, Marshall Silver, would say... That's just something in my brain. I gotta, I gotta work through. So yeah, no, Marshall was a, such a fun guest. Yeah. I, I really, really enjoyed chatting with Marshall. Well, I really, really enjoyed listening to you chat with Marshall. <laughs> <laughs> Matt was pretty quiet on this one, but that's. Uh, I feel like that's just a natural thing, though. That yeah, happens within our conversations. We, what you tend to find is that when it's like more tactical in the weeds, advertising, SEO, traffic, that kind of stuff, I tend to not let Joe get words in. And when it's like more mindset, <laughs> philosophy, that kind of stuff, Joe kind of goes to town on those conversations and this one is definitely more in that vein joe and marshall yeah. were having a real good conversation about rewiring your brain to think like a millionaire and i i, I love his analogies i love his uh <laughs> the, the way he approaches all of this i love the stories he tells to like oh God, really yes. make the concepts and you may or may not be hypnotized by this episode I think you'll certainly be hypnotized. <laughs> hypnotized? Yeah. I had a hard word with that. And, and actually, uh, Marshall Silver said, and your speech is coming back. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, there it is. Yes. It's back. I am certain that he helped you with that. <laughs> he certainly did. He certainly did. <laughs> <laughs> We're on to you, Marshall. We're on to you. <laughs> um, yeah, no, this is cool. And, and our audio editor had to, had to actually clean up Matt's track because he had a lot of... <laughs> Just kidding. No. He didn't do that. That's not why Matt was quiet. It is genuinely like it's it's actually interesting because when you and I are at like networking events or just chatting around with friends, yeah. anything philosophical is like usually a little bit more me or mindsety that is. Yeah. And then yeah, you're in the weeds tactics, and then that's when I kind of go like, eh, okay. Well, I love I love the topics. Like I love the mindset topics. Yeah. I love the philosophical topics. I do really enjoy them. In fact, most of the books I read aren't tactical; they're more philosophical, no, I know. philosophical, yeah. and uh, mindsety. Yes. Um. So that's typically what I study. But for whatever reason, I'm not the best conversationalist on those topics. It's all good. But when it gets like tactical and like ninja little hacks and stuff, all of a sudden, like I'm just firing off ideas left and right. Yeah. Um, but no, this episode is amazing. I'm really, really excited for you to hear this. And and the end result here is uh, the whole intention here is that Marshall is, is pretty much reprogramming or giving us all the tools to reprogram our brains to think like a multimillionaire. And he has all these stories and tactics and, and uh, the notes on this one are probably going to be... Uh, so damn actionable where you're going to... Probably they are and they always are. <laughs> so Matt, what's the dealio over there? Huh? Alrighty. So if you go to hustleandflowchart.com slash comp, that's C-O-M-P, we took notes on this episode for you. So all the strategies and philosophies and tactics and mind tricks and Jedi mind tricks, mind tricks and mm, yes. all that kind of stuff, we took notes for you. We actually have an expert note taker, and I mean that quite literally. She takes mm -hmm. notes for a living, mm -hmm. um, not only for us, but for other people as well, and she is really, really good at it. She so she's going to take notes on this episode for you, and you can get them for free over at hustleandflowchart.com slash comp, but... C-O-M-P. C-O-M-P, but you got to go quick because they're only available for like a week or two. I Something don't, like that. Yeah. They come down after a little bit and then they go into our vault. So if you want to get the notes for this episode, go to hustleandflowchart.com slash comp, get the notes. That's the vault. That's they're the, in there. <laughs> that's where they get locked away. It's a very, it's a very hollow sounding vault. <laughs> also, uh, Marshall Silver, he's got a really, really cool webinar where he talks about a lot of this stuff. Uh, if you're interested in checking out Marshall's webinar, you can go to MP. 
2m.com slash webinar. We're also going to make sure that's in the show notes. We're also going to make sure that's in the, the companion notes. Uh, but uh, let's go talk to Mr. Marshall Silver. Yo, Marshall, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. Glad to be here. Yeah. So we connect. It was actually a reconnect back uh, in War Room up in Beverly Hills about a month ago, I believe it was. Uh, Roland's event, Digital Marketers event. Good times. Yeah, and, it was uh, a great event, and it was great to meet you guys. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. We, we actually crossed paths a, a while before that. It must have been 2010-ish. We went to an event in Vegas at the M that Mike Filsame put on, and I believe you were a speaker ah, at it. I don't know yes, if you remember that event or not. <laughs> I think it was lo- like Launch Tree or something. Uh, something. I, I want to say affiliate.com. Somewhere around well, that he's, he's, he's always got an amazing event. In fact, I just spoke at one of his events in Florida about a week ago. Oh, you did? Wow. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Mike's still busy. Mm-hmm. But yeah, you left an impact on us. We're like, holy crap. Who, <laughs> who is this <laughs> madman? <laughs> and why is everybody running to the back of the room with their credit card out? <laughs> you must know something we don't. No, yeah. I don't, I don't think we question that element. We saw the presentation. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's good. true. Very good point. So that was that was our first introduction to you, and you know, since that point, you've been you've done a lot, and I, you know, we've chatted after War Room. You and I talked about you yep. know, kind of your radio and and some of this new stuff you're doing. Um, walk us through, kind of get us up to speed, but everyone else listening, kind of the the key points. I know you have an interesting background, all the way from living in a what a converted chicken coop, I think it was. Yeah, <laughs> and yep. Uh, working. Yeah, I mean- I uh, was, I'm one of 11 kids. My mom had babies from four different guys uh, Mm -hmm. while we were growing up. And the first house I lived in didn't have any running water, didn't have any electricity. We didn't have a phone. We had a a wood burning stove that heated up the house in a cold Michigan winter. And we got booted from the house. The house became condemned. We were living homeless in a station wagon. The local community knew we were going to die if we didn't have someplace to shower and live and so they converted a chicken coop. We lived in the chicken coop house for four years, had running water, had electricity, had, uh, you know, a phone. And so it was heaven to me other than clucking when I get happy, no adverse side effects. <laughs> but yeah. these days, these days, based upon what we're going to talk about, I'm guessing yep. in this interview, um, I'm coming to you live from my beach house in Southern California, right here in Carlsbad, uh, North County, San Diego. And my main residence is a 17,000 square foot palace in Las Vegas. Yep. So things have become very different in my life. Thank you, God. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. And uh, and you said uh, one of this was what working at a magic shop in San Diego. I want to hear about this a little bit more. Yeah, we, my family, myself and my three younger siblings, we left Michigan. My mom was a social worker and we were living in this actually Victorian mansion at, at pretty cheap rate rent. Because she was a social worker, she found out that a local judge had died. His family lived somewhere else, East Coast, West Coast, somewhere way away from Michigan. And they weren't using it. They weren't selling it. They weren't doing anything with the house. And so my mom contacted them and said, look, we can't afford to pay full rate. But if you'll rent the house out cheaply to us, you know, we can pay something and keep the house out. And so they did that. And then that was OK. The challenge was we were still really poor, even though my mom was working at the welfare office. Hmm. And so in, in Michigan, at least at that time, most of the houses were heated by oil. And so what the big trucks would do is they'd come over to your house and they'd load up these big tanks in your basement with oil hmm. and you would use that to heat. We had the, the rule was you couldn't be a season behind or they wouldn't give you any more oil. And so oh. it was September 1976. We uh, were two years behind. They'd given us two years, and my mother didn't see any sign of being able to pay back the oil bill, so we weren't going to get heat that winter. So she packed up the station wagon, and me and my younger three siblings, and we drove from Michigan to San Diego, where her mother lived. Mm. And we landed with like almost nothing in our, in our pockets. Uh, I had been talking to a guy that owned a magic shop. I'm 14 years old at the time. And I was talking to a guy that owned a magic shop over in North Park, like 30th and, and uh, University. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and uh, I cold called him the day that we arrived. I jumped on the bus, rode over there, cold called him at 14 years old. I said, look, I just arrived in the town. I uh, would love to work for you. I, I'm a really good salesperson. If you have any openings, let me know. He said, that's fantastic timing. He said, we have an opening right now. Hmm. And he said, uh, you can work in the shop here. And then. In a couple of months, we're going to open up a kiosk at the Sears store, and you can come 
sell magic tricks at this kiosk during the Christmas season at the Sears store. Mm. So he was actually, that guy, his name's Chuck Martinez, was my first millionaire mentor. And I watched him go from struggling and just getting by. I was 14, he was 23. And I watched him come up with a single idea that made him worth $60 million in the course of about, gosh, five years. Ooh. What was that? The, I, the idea was, yeah, the idea was he, he also owned a costume shop. Mm -hmm. And the costume shop only did business about two months out of the year, two weeks right before Halloween. Mm -hmm. In fact, we don't even see costume shops anymore. Right. And uh, he went to the Sears store and he said, look, I've got these very high end masks. It was right around the time that the uh, Star Wars came out. So these Darth Vader and Yoda and all these really <laughs> high end masks, uh, would you be interested in carrying them? And the buyer for Sears said, no, we can't buy them. They're too expensive. If we don't sell them, we've got to wait a whole year to sell them if we do. So, no, I, I can't buy your stock. Hmm. And he said, you know, uh, what about that space over there, the garden department? You close it on September 30th, and it doesn't reopen again until spring. What if you gave me that space for 30 days? I'll give you a portion of our sales. We'll see how it goes. It's dead space anyway. Mm -hmm. And the guy said, sure, why not? In the first year that we did the Halloween store, the first year we did $150,000 in goods because nobody knew what it was or even <laughs> that it existed. Yeah. Um, and that was at a 10 to 1 markup. So he put fifteen grand in, got back 150000 in gross sales. And as they say, the rest is history. Wow. The next year, the next year we had 15 stores. The next year we had 200 stores. The next year we had 1,500 stores. And now it, it's how Halloween is done. You, you take a big empty box. You turn it into a Halloween store for a month, and then at the end of the month when Halloween happens, you shut it down. Yeah. Oh, my God. He invented that idea. Love it. And you see that every year all over the country, maybe the world, whoever's celebrating um, Halloween. Yeah. And it. I mean, now is probably a great time with all these big box stores kind of going down. It's probably yep. booming for him. Yeah. I mean, you do. You see that every October. That I think they're called like the spirit stores or something. And they'll just pop up in the yes. random buildings that are for lease. And then I guess they get a one month lease and then they're out. Wow. Yep. And, and he is the one that invented that idea. He came up with the idea. He brought in some partners. The partners screwed him. And uh, kind of forced them out. They bought them out. So he took his pile of cash. And they ended up messing up the business, running it into the floor. He bought it back from them for pennies on the dollar with the intention of selling it. So he built it back up, sold it. But now he's the one that manufactures all of the Halloween costumes that they sell in those stores. So it's been a pretty amazing ride. <laughs> wow. So so was the was the, the, the costumes and the magic and, and all that stuff, was that what led you down the entertainment path? Well, I'd always been an entertainer. I've been on stage since I was seven years old, and I just celebrated my 57th birthday. So we're going into year nice. 50 of entertainment for me. And uh, from seven till 10, I was a magician. At 10 years old, I realized that I could probably get people to pay me to do magic shows. And I started doing professional magic shows. And when I discovered that they would actually pay me to do something that I love doing anyway, <laughs> that was the beginning of the race. Yeah. And so throughout the course of my life, I've, I've always been an entertainer. At 16 years old, I got hypnotized in my high school. And the hypnotist gave me a suggestion that when he said the words, Sonny Boy, I would stand up in my seat in the audience. I'd walk back to the stage. I'd fall on my butt. I'd roll my pant legs up above my knees. I'd climb on his lap. I'd put my thumb in my own mouth, and I'd say, sing it again, daddy. And, <laughs> and, and I remember, and it was here in San Diego, a guy named Michael Dean. And I remember going back to my seat in the audience and saying to myself, there is no way I'm going to do that. I'm already, I'm already socially awkward. I wear my sister's clothes to school because we're poor. Yeah. And, um, and so I'm in the audience, and he says the words, sunny boy. And I feel like a magnet's pulling me back to the stage. And the whole time I'm walking back to the stage, I'm thinking, I don't have to do this. But sure enough, on my butt, pant legs up, on his lap, thumb and mouth, sing it again, daddy. Wow. And I went, I went home that night and I was going, what just happened to me? Was I actually hypnotized or was I just doing what he told me to do? And I thought, well, what if he had told you to be more confident because he told you to do it? You did it. What if he had told you to get off drugs? Because at the time I was smoking pot. Mm -hmm. I thought, what if he had told me to go out and be a multimillionaire? Because he told me I could. I believe that it was certain. And I went out and took certain actions and created that. I realized in that moment, if that was hypnosis, then it was the most powerful force I had ever encountered to that point in my life. Mm. Wow. That, okay. There's a lot to unpack there. <laughs> that was amazing. So that was your first hypnotist experience or being hypnotized. And yep. uh, 
Yeah, because I feel like, I don't know, like, I don't know if this is the case commonly if, if do you know when you're hypnotized? I'm sure in that environment you knew very well. It was very clear. Uh, but what's, it, it, yeah. So the, the definition of hypnosis, uh, the non-critical acceptance of ideas or concepts on a subconscious level, in layman's terms, one person says something, the other person takes the action because they believe it's the right action to take. Or I say something to myself, and I take that action because I decide that that's the right action to take. And so in the sense of a stage show, there's a certain nonverbal contract. The hypnotist mm -hmm. comes out and says, I'm going to invite some people up here. We're going to have some fun. You're going to do some silly things. And then I'm going to send you back to your seat. And so through a process of certain language patterns, what happens is they, they go further and further down the rabbit hole. It's kind of like marketing. Mm -hmm. You know, if I, if I want to sell somebody a $50,000 ticket, to my inner circle mastermind summit, I generally speaking won't start with that $50,000 ticket. I'll start with a free presentation maybe. Maybe I'll teach them for 90 minutes and demonstrate to them powerful examples of how to reprogram their brain. Hmm. And then what I'll do is I will offer them something for you know a couple thousand dollars. They get to that live event. They're blown away by what they learn and what value they get. And then they take a look at everything else we have and they say, hey, that $50,000 product might be a good thing for me. So same thing with a stage invitation. He gets people or she gets people used to following directions, stand up, come forward, sit down, move around, uh, close your eyes, relax your neck, relax your body. Imagine there's a balloon attached to your hand, your hand rises up until what happens is the person is so far into the altered reality. It is their reality. Hmm. And since what we believe to be true is true for us, we end up being able to become that person. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So, Feel okay. So there's there must be so many ways. What are some common ways that hypnosis, uh, hip, <laughs> being hypnosis, uh, Jesus, I can't even talk right now. Hypnosis. hypnosis yes. <laughs> yeah. How can we? You know, Your is language this language is coming back to you it, now? It's <laughs> coming. Yeah. Thank you very much. So there's a stage form. Are there other forms that we should probably be aware of? Oh yeah. You know, again, um, hypnosis is influence. And influence is created through so many different modalities. One, one way of influence, of course, is the spoken word, mm -hmm. the selection of the words, the tonality of the words, the order of the words. Uh, other hypnosis is physiology. You know, when I walk into a room, I walk into the room as if I own it already. It's the distinction between being a person attempting to be a multi, a pauper attempting to be a multimillionaire and a multimillionaire whose money has not yet been deposited in their bank account. Mm -hmm. If when you know that you are a multimillionaire, even without the evidence of the money, then there's no angst, there's no doubt, there's no uh, anxiousness. You know it's certain. It's not a matter of can I, it's how do I. It's not a matter of if, it's when. Yeah. And when people approach every area of their life with that level of certainty, what it does, it creates a butterfly effect in the outside world that causes those results to occur. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it trickles all in all aspects of their life. Absolutely. Got it. So my, my, my wife, um, I hypnotized, I was doing an event in Boston. There were a thousand people in the room. I walk up the center aisle and there was this gorgeous young woman seated four rows back in the center aisle. I'm here to teach these thousand people who've all paid me a couple grand a piece uh, how to have better lives. And I see this beautiful girl and I think to myself, I should hypnotize her to ask me out on a date. <laughs> and, and while I'm teaching the class, unbeknownst to the class, and unbeknownst to her, I'm hypnotizing her to walk up to me and ask me out on a date on the first break <laughs> by walking by walking near her and saying, looking her directly in her eyes and saying, there are times when you see exactly what you want and you know you want it badly while I'm pointing at my own chest. And then I turn to address the rest of the audience and I hold my hand in front of her face, but I'm not looking at her at this point. It's as if what you want is so close, you could reach out and touch it. <laughs> and, and so I'm using these language patterns and, and on the break, I tell the audience, I say, look, when we go on break, I'm on break too. I don't answer questions on my break and I don't even really like to interact. I just need to re-energize just like you need to re-energize and take break too. So right. please let me have my breaks. And then I look directly at her and I say, there may be one of you <laughs> who knows it is a life change for you to walk up to me and ask me one very, very, very important question. I'm staring right at her. Mm -hmm. I say, the person that knows this to be true has permission to ask me that question. And so everybody goes on a break and my wife stands up, starts to walk down the aisle and 
starts to turn back toward the stage. No, shakes her head. No, walks a couple more steps, then throws up her hands, turns around, walks all the way back up to the stage where I'm sitting on a stool. And she said, I know you don't like to be bothered. And this isn't my character. And I really don't know why I'm doing this. And I'm thinking to myself, oh, I do. <laughs> and she says, uh, if you're you know, staying in the hotel and you'd like to grab a cup of coffee uh, at the end of the day, I'd like that. And then I said, if staying in this hotel is a prerequisite, I'd be happy to have my staff move me. <laughs> and, and I was just teasing her. Yeah. And I said, I, I have dinner plans and I uh, will call you after dinner. Why don't you give me your cell phone number? So she gives me her cell phone number. And then after dinner, uh, I give her a call and I said, look, um, there's a thousand people in this hotel that are probably in the lounge, probably in the coffee shop. If we go to any of those places, we won't get any privacy. Would you feel comfortable? coming over to my suite. And she said, sure. What, what should I do? I said, what room are you in? She gave me her room number and her room number was one off of mine. So mine was like 736. Hers was 737. Mm. Literally the room directly across the hall from me. Wow. And I said, uh, all you need to do is open your door, walk across the hall, knock on the door. That's my room. She <laughs> wow. said, uh, okay, I'll be there in a few minutes. And she hangs the phone up, and then all of a sudden, I hear screaming in the hallway. I can't figure out what's going on. I open up my door. There's nobody there. Uh, the screaming is coming from her room. She's going, oh, my God, oh, my God. He invited <laughs> me to his room. What should I do? Because <laughs> she didn't know who I was. She was the guest of somebody else at the seminar. She didn't know me from Tony Robbins. Oh. And the woman that brought her, I could hear her say to her, you need to go to his room. You're going to marry that man. Wow. And so I go back to my room. I'm feeling rather confident. And uh, sure enough, a few minutes later, she knocks on the door. I don't say a word. I open the door, I grab her by the hand, I, I pull her into the room and I give her a kiss. She collapses in my arms and I said, come on in, let's get to know each other. And <laughs> that was the beginning. Wow. That's a hell of a way to live right there. <laughs> I love so that. Cool. <laughs> when, when, I think uh, we, just, we, we just recruited 50 more hypnotists from your podcast audience. Uh, people that want to learn how to become hypnotists yeah. so they can date women. Oh, you're going to have more by the end of this episode. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> what, uh, when did you crack it to like, tell her the story, the full picture? How long do you wait? Oh gosh, <laughs> the next date. Oh, okay, you know, so we chat, cool. we we chatted and we hung out all all weekend and and then uh, <laughs> the next time we got on the phone, I I said, you do realize that I influenced you to ask me out on a date. She said, I know. <laughs> I said, I said, you're you're cool with that. She said, what you don't know is earlier in the day uh, when you were doing this exercise about a dream sheet and we had to write down all the things we wanted in our lives. One of the things I wrote down on my sheet is I want a man just like Marshall Silver. Ooh, mm. wow. <laughs> That's cool so again, it, 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 it comes back. To, it comes back to that certainty. It our does. babies, all three of our babies, were born at home via hypnosis. No drugs, no doctors, no pain. A lot of people would say they were conceived via hypnosis, and I can't really argue with that. <laughs> <Yeah>. um, so <laughs> the uh, wow. the thing is, is that it, it's all areas of our lives. So you know, when when you understand how things happen. It, it becomes very simple to know what you need to do to make a certain thing happen. There's three things we need to create anything we want, whether it's an ideal intimate relationship, whether it's becoming a millionaire, whether it's giving birth to babies. Number one, you must have self mastery. Self mastery is total control of your thoughts and emotions. Now, most people think that their emotions and their thoughts are random and out of their control. Yet the opposite is true. We choose every single emotion we hold. We choose every single thought we allow to go through our head. Mm. It's a muscle like anything else, though. So the more we exercise it, the stronger it becomes. The yeah. second thing we need to get anything we want in our lives is we need the tools for the task at hand. There are certain tools for relationships. There are certain tools for health. There are certain tools that will help you become a certain millionaire. And you've got to have those tools in place. Mm. The third thing you need to create whatever you want in any area is you can have the greatest self mastery of any human being. You can have all the proper tools. The reason most people don't have what they want in any given area of their lives is they're not able to take action in the present moment. They think they've got time. They think they'll get around to it. They're going to wait till things are more ideal. Then poof, they wake up. They're 50, 60, 70, 80 years old and their life is gone. Mm -hmm. And so we must be able to take certain action in the present moment because tomorrow never comes. Right. That's, that's huge. Okay. So can we break down each one of these a little deeper, starting with self mastery? So yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You're a big, uh, so it's all about certainty and you say it's all about how or what we choose for ourselves to be, you know, self mastering ourselves and getting to the point of where we want to be. 
So what's absolutely what are, what are you some... just said it yourself right there. What you believe to be true is true for you, nothing else. Mm. And you get to choose what you believe to be true. Got it. So how, how can someone, yeah, if, if maybe it's surface level, we can say it, but maybe that self-talk in there creeps in late at night or when stressful shit happens, you know, wh- how can we make sure self-mastery is still solid in those moments? It doesn't matter how many times you get thrown off a horse. What matters is that you noticed you got thrown off. What did you learn? Mm. How quickly did you stand up and get back on? Mm. And it's, you know, it's, it's story after story after story of the Henry Fords and the Thomas Edison's and the Elon Musk's and, and, you know, the the Steve Jobs of the world who, who make a fortune and then lose it, then make a fortune and then they lose it, or they make a fortune, they lose it, or they just lose, 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 then they win. Mm -hmm. The distinction is though, my experience has been that certain people know that everything is temporary and that they bottom line do not put much energy into failures. They, they don't keep focusing on them. You know, we, I have three babies. Like I said, they're all born at home by hypnosis, no mm-hmm. drugs, no doctors, no pain. We streamed prosperity's birth, my daughter's birth yeah. uh, online so that people could see, women could see that they had a choice. They didn't have to let the doctor cut them open or stick a big, huge needle in their back Good. to have babies. Babies are meant to be born naturally. Right. And uh, while we were streaming it, there were trolls. You know, people were making nice commentary, but there's always trolls. Yep. Mm-hmm. And there were a couple of trolls that were going, this isn't real. She couldn't be given birth. If she was given birth, she'd be in a lot more pain. She wouldn't be moaning like she was having an orgasm. Right. And uh, one guy was relentless. And I, I wasn't looking at the chat <clears throat> because I had my wife in trance. We were both in the bathtub together. She was wearing a bikini top because, you know, wanted to mm-hmm. be tasteful. I was topless because we wanted ratings. <laughs> so we of course. Were, <laughs> I, I've got her in trance and I'm, I'm singing, I'm singing to her in trance, keeping her relaxed. And she's just going through it. It looks like she's having an orgasm. And yeah. then all of a sudden I reach down and the baby's born and I pick up prosperity and I bring her into frame. And the same troll later on, I realized had typed into the chat. See, that's not even a real baby. This is all fake. <laughs> oh, geez. <laughs> and, and, and so what's fascinating to me is that so many things are outside of people's realm of understanding. The only difference between a moron and a genius is they know who they are. Mm. A moron looks at a circumstance and says, I don't know how to do that. I'll never figure it out. I'm a moron. Oh, yuck, 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 yuck. And they walk away. A genius looks at a a similar circumstance and says, I have no idea how to do that. Yet I am a genius. I will figure it out. With the babies, you know, they, they, they all walk at different times. And I devised kind of a trick to get my kids to walk. Mm-hmm. What I would do is I would uh, I would hold a little wooden dowel, and rather than them holding my hand when we walk, I would hold the dowel, and they would grab the other end of the dowel and walk along with me. Uh-huh. And eventually, I'd loosen my grip on the dowel until suddenly they're walking along, holding this dowel in the air, just walking along. They don't even realize I'm let go. Yeah. And it's the same thing for for every area of our lives. You don't give up on a kid and say because they didn't they didn't walk initially. Oh, that, that one's not going to be a walker. Yeah, he's probably not going to be a walker. You might as well stop trying. Kid. <laughs> There's certain things that we just hold as truths, and we say no, they're going to walk eventually. Whenever they do, they do. And I often ponder, you know, we we have in our time some really strange things that have happened. A lot of it has to do with entitlement Mm -hmm. and people thinking that they're entitled to other people's efforts and entitled to other people taking care of them and thinking the government should take care of me. And I'm going, you don't realize the government doesn't make anything on its own. Fees, fines, and taxes, that's how the government makes its money. And that's all coming out of my pocket and any other hardworking person's pocket. Mm -hmm. The thing uh, that I've already programmed my kids, they're eight, six, and four, and I've told them unmistakably, you are leaving this house by your 18th birthday. You will be living on your own by your 18th birthday. The good news is I'm going to teach you how to own a house before your 18th birthday. Mm. If more parents viewed their world that way and and, and, and set their kids up for success, their kids early on, like my kids do, they'd say, dad, what can we do for money? What can we do to earn money? Yeah. Uh, You know, and so I've got a theater that I've acquired here in Carlsbad, California, that we're going to be putting a show of certainty to into on Friday and Saturday nights. So you'll come, you'll watch this show, which is basically a reworked, re-semantic, uh, hypnotic show. And the, the performer, the certainologist, will, will say, I'm going to use certain language patterns tonight that are so compelling, they are irresistible. You're going to laugh until you hurt. You're going to gasp in amazement. And by the time I'm done, you're going to want to be a certain person. And then the show goes on. And in the show, they do everything from speaking a language from another planet 
to walking on broken glass. I'll take three women, make their bodies stiff and rigid, lay their ankles on one support, their neck on another support, and I'll walk up their bodies like a human staircase. And at the very end of the show, the performer, in this case, me initially, will say, hey, if you love what you saw and you'd like to know how to utilize it in your life for better relationships, for more money, for emotional, mental, and physical well-being, then on Tuesday night, come back to this very theater and we'll give you two tickets to get to the event. We'll teach you how we did what we did and how you can use it in your life. Hmm. And so, you know, with my kids, uh, the moment they knew that we were opening the show in our theater, they said, we want to do a show. We want to do a show. Um, I was poor growing up, so I didn't understand the way it works for kids that their parents aren't poor. Yeah. Uh, my kids are, you know, in karate class and in, in dance class and in singing and guitar. And, and um, I remember the day that my wife came home and she said, the boys have been invited to join Black Belt Club. I said, oh, that's awesome. They're doing well. She said, yeah. I said, what's Black Belt Club? She said, it's an 18 to 24 month program to help them get their black belt. Whoa. I looked at, I looked at her and I said, that is really clever. Yeah. That is really clever marketing. And so, <laughs> so I realized that they just sold my kid a two year package. Yep. And, and who, who's going to say no to their kid? No, you can't, you've been invited, but you can't be there. But mm. I thought, how cool would it be if kids were taught how to be entrepreneurs early on? So I, I am creating a show that the kids will do on Saturday and Sunday. My three kids will do on Saturday and Sunday. The show is called kid show. It's a four, it's a magic show by kids for kids. Yeah. And so my kids will perform. And at the end of the show, much like the show of certainty, they'll say, isn't it fun to know that you don't have to wait till you're an adult to have your own business. Ooh. We have our own business making thousands of dollars every single week. We'd like to show you how you could have your own business. Come on back after school on Wednesday at four o'clock and we'll teach you how to join our young entrepreneur society. So now the mm -hmm. kids come back. They're taught how to be entrepreneurs. They're, they're taught what businesses kids can be in right now. And in the case, in the course of doing that though, not only are they shown how to get into their own business, which now allows them to pay for their class, right. they're also <laughs> taught in the class, hey, by referring other kids to this class, you could pay for your class even faster. What parent doesn't want their kid <laughs> becoming an entrepreneur early on and helping out with the bills? Yeah. Well, you're flipping the script on on what society seems to be doing these days. You know, kids going back to live with their parents until they're 30 plus years old and not or having... More. Yeah, it, it's crazy. So yeah. you're... What it what kind crazy. of what kind of ages are you uh, are you looking to to bring to these shows? I'm uh, the, the, as far as the show is concerned, all ages will be welcome. Of cool. course, you know my daughter is four, um, my son is six, my other son is eight, and we're thinking a younger audience. But I also think that they're as you know as we're doing this. I originally thought that the classes for young entrepreneurs would be somewhere in the range of seven to twelve. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I also realized, though, that, you know, those teens and, and those or late teens even and, and pre-adults, again, if, if it if it's my kid, I want them learning how to run a business. If it's my kid, oh, yeah. I want them hungry enough to to know that if there's something they want, they don't have to wait for mom and dad to get it for them. They can get it on their own, have more pride in getting it on their own and also be limitless as to what they can have because they can have anything they can earn. Mm. Mm. Yeah, no, I'd love to be in the loop on that. I, I actually have a six-year-old daughter and a four-year-old son, so right in that Perfect. right in that age range of uh, your kids. Yeah, and once you get those shows going, uh, when is your when are you opening the theater for these shows? We're about a month to five five weeks out. So okay. to be safe, I, I'd say we're going to probably open up. We wanted to get it done sooner. The theater that I acquired it was, was built in 1927. And mm -hmm. because it is a historic building, there were certain surprises we hadn't anticipated, but it's, it's going to be spectacular. It's a 300 seat house. People are going to walk in and say, this is gorgeous. Nice. And yeah. we're going to, we're going to be bogging. So we're, we're about four to six weeks out. Cool. Yeah. Well, expect us to be attending one of those early shows for sure. Cause it's just, yeah, right you'll, you'll dig it. It's going to be so much fun. Very cool, man. Well, so self mastery, it sounds like I love the analogy you had with uh, training uh, one of your daughters, it sounded like with a kind of a little dowel, and it sounded like training wheels. Like you're just, you're slowly. That's kind exactly of, what it is. Yeah, weaning them off. So, what are some like training wheels that you see for self mastery for entrepreneurs, people listening to establish that multi millionaire mindset? Some common ones. What you, you believe. What you believe to be true is true for you. What you focus on expands. So many times when people aren't getting what they want, they focus on what they don't have when what you need to focus on is what you do have. And, you know, I was blown away at War Room by you guys, and I was so impressed 
by just the way you've approached podcasting mm. and in the way that you, you know, you put it together and you got it done and you said, all right, now we're going to multi uh, use this for multiple different distribution points. Mm -hmm. And here's how we're going to monetize this thing. And here's, you know, we're going to produce them all in one day so that it's not burning up our entire week. <laughs> and, you know, here's the strategy to get people onto your podcast. And here's the way you do this or do that. I was extremely impressed. Awesome. So number one, what, what you believe to be true is true for you. Number two, what you focus on expands. So focus on what you have, not what you don't have. Uh, number three, everything begins with a single step. So do something. And mm -hmm. then number four, and this is most important. Reality is created by validation. Yeah. And when you understand that idea, all you got to do is go look for somebody else that's done what you seek to do and hack them. Take a look at it and hack them. You know, we've got some people inside the space, as you guys know, mm -hmm. inside the podcast space, inside the social media space that are crushing it. Mm. Not to the tune of a million bucks a year, to the tune of tens of millions of dollars a year. What's yeah. fascinating to me is, you know, I watch other speakers and I watch other performers and I'll share the stage with Tony Robbins three, four, five times during the course of a year. Mm -hmm. Tony gets paid, generally speaking, for the audiences that, that I share the stage with them, about a quarter of a million dollars plus expenses. Mm -hmm. I stand on that stage and I work for free. That same audience, those same people that Tony just spoke in front of, will end up being about $3 million on the back end to me. Wow. And, and so, you know, I, I take a look at other people and their, their, their processes, and I, I don't always understand. I don't always get it. I watch, I was on, uh, I was flying to an event uh, in Dallas. And so I had chartered a plane and I, I knew another speaker, very good speaker, very talented guy, uh, amazingly talented. I'm not going to say his name because mm -hmm. the, the minute I say his name, you would know who he, who he was because I said his name. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the thing about it is we're on the plane and we're headed out to this event. And I said, so are you going to be selling? He said, I don't know. I said, you don't know whether or not you're going to be selling? He said, no. I, he said, are you going to be selling? I said, Absolutely. I, I seldom want to get on a stage where I'm not allowed to sell because I teach people in order to make money. You got to learn to sell something. Sure. And so, <laughs> so, so we go back there and I close and I sell and I do well. And he gets on stage and he's massively well received. And one of the people asks him a question about her podcast. She stands up, puts her hand up. She said, uh, I have a podcast and I'm wondering how many times, uh, you know, how often when I'm doing my podcast that happens once a week, how often should I sell things? And so as not to be too pushy. And he said, every single time he mm. said, imagine this. He said, y you create this relationship with these people where you teach, you teach, you teach for four weeks. You don't sell anything. And then all of a sudden you say, Hey, on week five, I got this thing for sale. They're going to go, Oh, yuck. We're friends. Mm. You, you don't <laughs> try to sell me something. Yeah. And then he didn't close. So we're on the jet on the way back and we're sitting there we're having a, a glass of wine. And I said, Hey, do you remember that advice you gave that woman? about her podcast and selling every single time. I thought that was remarkable advice. He said, thank you. I said, and I also noticed you didn't sell anything. <laughs> and he says, well, I said, no, well, I'm your guy. I want to teach you how to crush it from the stage. Like you crush it in all the other areas of your life. Let me show you how to take an event like we do. And, and after the initial event, have a, a lifetime value of that customer to be between 15 and $20,000 per every single person, including the ones that didn't buy and the ones mm. that do buy. Mm. And uh, he said, you're kidding me. I said, no, that's what our lifetime value is for any person that gets to our beginning event and we show them how to grow their business because the best way to help have better customers is help them have more money. It's to help them with their business. When they have more money and better business, they'll want to buy more stuff from you because that was the byproduct. Right. Yeah. That's Wow. Yeah, and, that, and so did he follow through? Has he been uh, doing more selling from stages now? <laughs> Just curious. Um, we we are about to enter into, and, and again, I don't want to say too much because right, yeah. uh, it will probably be figured out sooner or later. This guy's remarkable. He's he at what he does, he's the best in the world. Got it. Yeah. <laughs> and so, starting on Friday, uh, I'm going to begin training him on how to crush it from the stage because it comes down to two things. It comes down to curriculum. Do you have a path for your customer? What is that ascension you know, process? How do they go from just listening to the podcast to subscribing to whatever you've got that they can subscribe to, to getting together with you in a live event? Because that's always where the best dollars are going to be created. People want to touch the cloth. They want to be a part of a community. Mm. And then, you know, what do you have? Some people will buy nothing. Some people will buy a little. Most people will buy a little more. 
There's some customers though, they say, whatever you're selling, tell me how many I should buy. Right. That's where all of your margins are on that high end high, you know, that, that final customer, that's where all of your margins are. Hmm. How, what, what a percentage, uh, what's an average percentage that you find that those people, is it like 10, 20% or are we talking less or a lot more? In my audiences, and of course I have an unfair advantage, I understand uh, not only the language patterns of influence, I also have been doing this for 34 years, uh, the, the educational side of things. In our audiences, roughly, roughly uh, 20% of my audience is going to buy everything I have. That's amazing. Got it. That's there's the there's the eighty twenty principle in action right there. <laughs> yep. <laughs> in a nutshell, yep. <laughs> love it. Okay. Yep. Yeah. And and every single person listening, even off stage or you know not stage or not, has the opportunity to do that online. But taking it on on a uh, on a stage where right in front of someone. I mean, War Room was a perfect example. If we actually had an offer something for, you know, podcast consulting or something like that, we probably could have landed a bunch of clients. It's a little you would have. You would have landed at least one. That's for sure. I know. I'm and, talking and, to and, him right now. And, and, and you, because we've talked about that. <laughs> we did. And you, yes, you would have because you got to keep in mind War Room. I don't even know what they're charging these days. Thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars to get into War Room. Every single person in there is a business owner. Every mm-hmm. single person in there is massively qualified. Oh yeah. And that was a you know I, I, I talked to to uh, the the boys you know the people around War Room yeah. and I said I don't know how you guys can do this. You give so much value. You didn't sell anything. Mm-hmm. And you, you know, not only threw the parties and bought food and, and all these things, it was remarkable. Yeah. And they said, we make our money on the deals that are done with the people that are a part of War Room. And I said, I understand that. You could make money both ways. Mm-hmm. And nobody would be insulted by that process. True. Very true. Yeah. No, they did it right. That was definitely the most, I would say, the most well put together uh, and great group of people uh, that we've been around for a very long time for an event. Well, you know, the, the founders are amazing. All four of the partners are just first class, amazing, yeah. amazing guys. Yeah. Mm-hmm. We'll let them know that. <laughs> no, they know that yeah. for sure. We're doing the rounds yeah, through all the you. digital marketer people on our podcast. In fact, the only one we haven't locked down yet is Perry. <laughs> Perry will get him. <laughs> That's funny. Um, yeah. Hey, Matt, did you have anything on that before? No, go ahead. I, I know you cool. were kind of working a line of questioning. There, yeah. So. <laughs> well, I was just curious because uh, I remember you talking about you have these four kind of steps to, I think you call them like the steps to life or enlightenment. And yep. I feel like they fit perfectly when we're kind of talking about these training wheels and trying to break these old patterns. Can we talk about those a little bit, your steps? Yeah, I can. I want to just take it to the, the next step of the three things because we were talking oh, about sure. self-mastery. Yeah. The next thing is the tools for the task at hand. So in relationship, in intimate relationships, there are certain tools that cause the relationship to be really good. As an example, I had been married twice before I met my one true wife. Hmm. And my first marriage, I was 21 years old. We were both young and dumb. We got married, decided we didn't want to be married. We got divorced, stayed boyfriend and girlfriend living together for another year and a half before we finally just threw up our hands and said, we're good friends. We're not good partners. Hmm. The uh, thing about my first wife at 21 years old, I I work whenever there's work. I don't really have work hours. And she wanted somebody that worked nine to five, didn't talk about work at night and definitely (laughs) never worked on the weekend, but she wanted to go to the river. Mm -hmm. My next wife was certifiable. And I should have known she was certifiable because we dated for eight years before we got married and she was certifiable during those times. And I'm not, <laughs> not saying this to insult her. It's yeah. fact. The uh, thing though is, is that I could not have understood the blessing of my bride had I not gone through those experiences, especially the second one. And so for relationship, one of the, the tools of relationship is Erica and I, my wife, we have no secrets. Mm-hmm. And uh, she has access to my cell phone. She knows the code to unlock it. She can get on any of my computers. She can go through any of my journals. We don't have any secrets. And that would have saved Tiger Woods about $200 million. Oh, yeah. (laughs) The thing about it is, the thing about it is, is I decided when I met her to be authentic. I didn't send my representatives to the first few dates. I said, look, I'm, I'm wealthy. I'm an entertainer. I've been on stage. I'm charismatic. I have dated, in quotation marks, a lot of women. You need to know that. If we date... Chances are we're going to run into women that I've dated and I'm not going to lie to you. I'm going to say we dated. Sure. And uh, so every step of the way, the things that I thought would make her run away, I said, no, I'm going to tell her early on, like right away so that she can either say yes or no, you know, leave or stay. Right. Uh, In making money, the number one tool in making money is what we've been talking about. You must 
learn the skills of irresistible influence and fall in love with the entire process of selling. When I sell something to you, it is good for you, it is good for me, it is good for the entire economy, everybody wins. Because it starts to create this thing called velocity. Imagine that I am uh, driving from my home in Vegas to my home on the, on the ocean in San Diego. And it happens to be EDC, Electric Daisy Carnival weekend. It's Sunday mm-hmm. night, it's about five o'clock. And what normally takes me three and a half hours because all these Southern Californians uh, dressed in furry boots and neon <laughs> bracelets are, are on the 15 coming down the highway, yeah. it's bumper to bumper. I'm, I'm five hours, five and a half hours into it and I'm only three quarters of the way there. And I'm thinking to myself, man, I either need to pull over and get a cup of coffee or go stay in the motel. I'm not going to make it. It's, it's taking too long. So I pull off in this little flea bite town that has uh, – it's, uh, it's got a motel, but it's not really a motel because the letter M is burned out on the sign, so it's an hotel. <laughs> is this, is this, this hotel there. Is this Baker, California? <laughs> it's a little bit beyond Baker. Okay. Yes. You, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah. beyond Baker, though. Been there. Um, it, it's, got, it's got a uh, bar, restaurant. It's got a grocery store, and it's got an automotive repair shop gas station. Perfect. So I pull over into this hotel, and I pull into the parking lot, and I notice – 10.30 at night, there's not a single car there, so it's completely vacant. I go into the lobby, and there's a man behind the counter. He says, how can I help you? And I said, how much to stay in your fine establishment? He says, it's $100 a night. And, and I look around, and I look at him. I said, $100 a night? He smiles. He says, we're the only game in town. And he starts <laughs> to sound a bit like Jack Nicholson in The Shining, so I'm getting concerned here. <laughs> so so um, I said, okay, i tell you what. Um, how about I, I pull $100 out of my pocket. I put it on the counter. I said, I'm going to go check out the room. If I decide to stay, you keep my money. If I decide I'm not going to stay, I'll come back, get my 100 bucks, be on my way, grab a cup of coffee. He says, yep. sure. I no sooner get out of eye shop. He grabs my $100 bill, runs across the street to the bar, says to the owner of the bar, as he puts the $100 bill on the bar, hey, bud, this should take care of my bar tab. Oh, my God. Bud picks up the $100 bill hands it to one of his uh, patrons that's drinking at the bar. He says, hey, John, this should take care of the groceries. I bought your grocery store. John takes a $100 bill, hands it to his buddy that he's drinking with, Rod. He says, hey, Rod, this should take care of the repairs that you made to my car. Rod takes a $100 bill, winks at the woman at the end of the bar and says, you know what this is for, gives her the money. She jumps up (laughs) from the bar, runs across the street to the motel, puts the $100 bill on the counter, says to her boyfriend, honey, that $100 I borrowed from you. I want to pay you back. (laughs) <laughs> I decide I'm not going to stay, so I walk out, I grab my $100 bill, buy a cup of coffee, and I'm on my way. The question I have to anybody listening to this podcast right now is, were those debts all paid in full? And the answer is yes. Of course they were. Mm. The distinction is that people that don't know how to make money don't understand that when we sell things, it's good for the entire economy. When we buy things, it's good for the entire economy. When we come from a place of abundance and prosperity rather than a place of lack, When we willingly go into the marketplace and let our money flow, everybody wins. Hmm. So when you believe in what you're selling, you have a moral and ethical obligation to sell it. The challenge is if we do something well, we'll do it often. If we don't do it well, we won't do it very often, if at at all. And nobody is a natural salesperson. Every single gambit, every language pattern, every single – tool that I use to influence people to buy things from me, to overcome phobias, to be more confident, you name it. They're all very scripted. They're all very specific and they're all very tried and tested and uh, rehearsed, reviewed and revised. Mm. Third thing I mentioned that you've got to do to be able to create the success you want in your life. Number one, you got to have self mastery. Number two, you got to have the proper tools Number three, you must have the ability to take action in the present moment. When people ask me, uh, how are you different than, say, a Tony Robbins or a T. Harv Eker or any number of trainers or speakers, the distinction is I get right in your head. I speak directly to the subconscious mind. I don't just teach you. I program you to be a different person, whether it's a certain millionaire or a certain husband or a certain healthy guy. I'm going to teach you how to be that thing. And once you are that thing in your head, all the other answers show up. Hmm. So have you been uh, hypnotizing us as you've been talking through this all thing? <laughs> like, uh, we... I'm saying the words, I'm saying the words, of course not. While I nod my head up and down. <laughs> I love it. Cause I figured I didn't really have to ask you to do a little session. <laughs> oh, yeah. 
<laughs> you can you can be certain. Yeah. So getting back to the question you asked me though about enlightenment. Yes. Um, you know, yes. all I, I like to study things. I like to see what makes makes people tick. I like to see what causes people to have really healthy relationships. I like to see what causes people to make buying decisions. I also believe um, that religion is the most hypnotic medium on the planet. Mm -hmm. That religion, and, and I'm talking about organized religion, not a faith in God, not a belief in God, because I have a very deep belief in God, and I'm not a fan of religion. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the challenge with religion is too many times people have, uh, they're indoctrinated to believe the whole package must be true if one element is true. Right. And so as I've studied religions, and some, some cults pull themselves off as religions, and they're not, they're cults. Um, what happens is th there's, there's often a word that is tossed around called enlightenment. And my own personal belief is that enlightenment is living in the light. Uh, there's a book by Neil Walsh. It's called Conversations with God. Mm -hmm. And if yep. your viewers, listeners haven't uh, read it, they should. The first one especially is a good one. The second and third one I thought were books that were written to just sell more books. The, the first one, though, talks about God. Okay. And it says if something's of, of God, it's got three elements to it. Number one. It, it comes from a place of love, not a place of fear. Uh, love is an expansion. Fear is a contraction. That's why the scripture, the, the expression, there is no question love is not the answer to is true. There's no question an expanded mind cannot answer. Mm. Second thing he says is if it comes, it comes from a place of joy, meaning it makes you feel good if it's of God. And then thirdly, it is the truth. And the truth isn't gray. The truth is black and white. It either is or it isn't. And so step one of living in enlightenment, living an enlightened life is to forgive everybody, everything, especially yourself, because without that forgiveness, we give power away. Sometimes people say forgive and forget. Yeah. I don't think that's possible. In fact, I don't even think it's wise. I think we should forgive and choose to remember no more. Mm. Yes. So you can pull back if Second. you ever needed to, but yeah, but we don't need yeah. to stay there in the past. It's exactly. It's like Ronald Reagan said, a trust yet verify. Right. Yep. Uh, st step two. Once we have forgiven, uh, what happens is we take away the power of anything which offended us. And that's the reason we forgive is to take away the power it has over us. If we don't forgive, it still maintains power. Mm. Uh, Nelson Mandela, after having been in prison for so many years, was asked, uh, do you have ill will toward the people that held you captive? He said, why in the world would I let them hold me captive one more day? Mm, yes. And I thought that was very powerful. That is. Step yeah. two is to surrender and find your life perfect. Because finding your life less than perfect is a waste of time. I shave my head. My, my gorgeous head won't grow a full head of hair. So I shave my head, telling my head, <laughs> uh, hey, if you won't do what I want you to do, I'll do what I want to do anyway. <laughs> and... Uh, and, you know, some guys get hung up on, on that, that their head doesn't grow hair the way they want it to. For me, no, just excel in other areas. Yeah. You know, both of you guys are gorgeous, good looking men with full heads of hair. Uh, it's <laughs> not you. something you have to think about. Yet most people have a different, what I call focus of rejection. They say, if only this one thing were different in my life, man, my whole life would be so good. And I say, surrender, find your life perfect and deal with what emerges, no matter what. Mm. I'm sure when you guys were starting your podcast, and you're not getting a whole lot of downloads. There were many conversations in the beginning. That said, eh, is this really worth it? Oh, you yeah. really want to do this? <laughs> you know Except it, man. You just kept at it. <laughs> yep. You just kept at it. The third step, and this is the big one. This is where you start getting everything you want. Step one, forgive. Step two, surrender. Find your life perfect. Deal with what emerges. Step three, utilize versus tolerate. What do I mean by that? Do mm. not put up with the circumstances of your life. Make them perfect. Uh, utilize whatever happens. You, you go to get on a plane and the flight is delayed two hours rather than get upset and go, oh, crap, this sucks. Immediately look around the airport and say, who here am I supposed to meet that I would not have met had my plane been on time? Mm. Or just look up at the heavens and say, dear God, thank you so much for delaying my flight so we don't fly into that flock of seagulls, crash and all die. Right. Uh, you know, so many times people, they, they get upset with their lives. Again, I was married twice before my one true wife. I, I've made money. I've lost money. I've made money. I've lost money. I've made money. And here I am today. What, I've, what I know to be true, even in the times when I was going through a divorce, even in the times when I was broke, those times were essential for me doing better and better and better each stage of the way. So when we begin to utilize everything that comes up, what some people might think was not good, we just use it. We say, okay, what's perfect about this? 
then it gets to step four. We will have so much abundance. The only thing left to do to reach complete and total enlightenment is what we're doing on this podcast right now. Mm -hmm. And that is to give it away, yes. serve other people. Yes. That is that is so damn. That is probably the easiest way to jump out of a funk. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I did that over this weekend. You know, I had like a little funk, and and I actually went out there and chose to serve uh, some families and pay for their meals and 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 some gifts and whatnot. Uh, and it was it felt amazing. Like, hey, that funk was gone in about five minutes. Right when I chose to do that. Yeah, and and, 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 and a simple expression to kind of keep that in mind. Yeah, get out of your head, get into their lives. Mm, I like that. Get mm. out of your head. Get into their lives. I like that. Very cool. You know, I, I was I was going through a period in my life where I was going through a divorce. I uh, was dating the girlfriend from hell, who not only was cheating on me, she was systematically stealing money from me. I uh, was being threatened by the government for something I hadn't done. Threatened to be thrown in prison for twenty seven years, and mm. I hadn't done anything. Uh, be absolutely certain. In this country and all countries, this country too, you are guilty until proven innocent. Correct. Mm -hmm. yeah. And 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 so I was. Uh, I had a woman that I was crying on her shoulder every single day. She was running my companies. Unbeknownst to me, she had embezzled over a million dollars. Oh man! And so all of this is going on at once. And and I I at one point just said, you know what? I'm done. I went to the government and I said, look, either take this to trial because they weren't going to take it to trial. They're just trying to drag drag me through the mud. I said, either take me to trial and I'll let the cards fall wherever they will, or I'm going to sue you for interrupting in my life. And uh, I went to the, 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 I was married for 11 months. The divorce was taken four and a half years because my ex was dating the judge that was overseeing our case. Oh, and, uh, and I was paying her attorney's fees. I was paying my attorney's fees. And the judge forced me to pay spousal support too. I went to the judge. I didn't know that he was dating her. I went to the judge though. And I said, look, I'm not paying another dime. You can throw me in jail for contempt. Uh, all they have to do is pick a number. And whatever that number is, I'll figure out a way to pay it. <laughs> and so they, after four and a half years, pick a number. And that was off my, my plate. I went to the girlfriend from hell and I just said, look, we're done. I, I'm better than this and I'm moving on. And now I look back and my life is absolutely perfect. So blissed. I'm so grateful every single day I've got. The, my wife is the best decision I ever made. My children are perfect. We live in a 17,000 square foot palace in Las Vegas. Our vacation home is right on the water in Southern California. I fly back and forth in a private jet. Thank you, thank you, thank you for this abundance. Yet I also know that at any moment I could have just given up and said, you know what? My life wasn't meant to be good. My life was meant to be a struggle. And, and rather than live a life of maintenance, I'd rather live a life of adventure. Mm. So anybody that's going through tough times right now, I want you to know this too shall pass. It is temporary. You are destined for great things. You are indeed a multimillionaire, even dare say billionaire, even if the money hasn't been deposited in your bank account. The proper people are going to show up in your life. The proper relationships will be created. You keep reminding yourself you are a king's kid and everything's going to turn out just fine. Mm. I love that. I love that. I, I, have, I have one last sort of quick question before we, we sort of wrap up here. Um, I'm, I'm curious how you deal with, with people's money blocks. You know, that's obviously a common thing among entrepreneurs is they're, they're afraid to invest in themselves or afraid in, to invest in the growth of, of their business. What, what sort of advice or exercise or way of looking at it do you talk to people about getting over some of these money blocks and, and fear of investing in themselves and their business? When I was contemplating shaving my head and just saying, you know what, I'm going to go for a different look. I looked around to find very, very successful people with shaved heads. Mm. As stupid as that sounds right now, um, it's not stupid for somebody going through a circumstance. We always think whatever circumstance we are in is way worse than what somebody else is going through. Right. So what I had to do is I had to, since reality is created by validation, I said, okay, he's massively successful with a shaved head. He's massively successful with a shaved head. And then I said, I've gotten the validation to go do it. If somebody has money blocks, what they need to do, hang out with me. Come to Turning Point. Come let me teach you how to turn up your wantingness and then also turn up your certainty that not only can you savor the wanting as much as the having, I'm going to show you how to be certain you can have it. Because the only way to remove those blocks is to create enough validation, enough examples, enough obvious uh, people starting off worse than where you are right now that are now living an amazing life. Think about it. Amazon is 20 years old. In 20 years, Jeff Bezos has become the wealthiest known person on the planet. 
Mm-hmm. How boggling is that? Mm-hmm. 20 years. And in the first, what was it, seven, eight years, they lost billions. That's with a B, yeah. billions of dollars. So no, right now, you you are one idea away from a billion dollars. One idea. That's all it's going to take. You know, I uh, oftentimes grab an Uber and I don't feel like driving. I'll just grab an Uber because to me, if somebody else is going to drive, I can do whatever I need to do in the back of the car. Mm-hmm. The, uh, the thing is, is a lot of times, uh, you know, people don't realize Uber was somebody's idea, just an idea. And so realize you've got a billion dollar brain. Uh, anything that you are holding to be true that is a limitation or a block around money is not real. It's a lie. The challenge is most people weren't raised in households that had a healthy, uh, a healthy version of what money was. I certainly wasn't. Mm-hmm. I had to figure it out on my own. My own kids, you know, they fly in a private jet wherever we go. We, we have two homes. We get in a jet. We don't bring anything with us because we have clothes in both locations, toothbrushes in both locations, stock refrigerators in both locations with management to manage the properties. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, they think that's normal. They think getting on stage and entertaining people is normal. Because they've been on stage for every moment they can remember. Mm-hmm. That's their natural habitat. Wow. So if you hung out with a millionaire often enough and you saw they were just an ordinary person that viewed the world in an extraordinary way, you will lose your money blocks. Mm-hmm. And that's the reason, you know, I'm, I'm coming out of retirement. I, I went into retirement when, I, when my son was born. I had every single bucket on my list. And then my wife got pregnant again. And I decided to stay retired with my two boys and my bride. And then when my daughter, Prosperity, was born, I said, you know what? I don't think I'm done. I think there's something else I want to do. I just didn't know what I wanted to do. Coming out of retirement, we are launching Certainty International. Certainty International uh, will have, we already have our first one about to open, uh, Certainty Centers, Certainty Theaters, where Mm -hmm. a certain community can come together and behave in a certain way. In other words, it's successful people coming together to network with other successful people on a regular basis in a brick and mortar building, not once every three months, like, you know, some seminars might be every single day. Mm -hmm. And so every single day you get in your funk, there's a place that you can go and not only get out of your funk by being with people that are in that funk that can help you out because that's what friends are supposed to do. Also though, Certainty International will have a nonprofit arm attached to it called the Certainty Institute. Certainty Institute uh, and, and amongst the good things that they do will help to combat child sex trafficking and also to educate homeless people that don't want to be homeless. Ooh, I love that. That is so cool. We need a certainty podcast too, as an arm of that. I agree. To feed it all. I agree. <laughs> no, that, that is absolutely amazing. Yeah. yeah you you kind of just described why we created a podcast too. I mean, we 100%. get to spend so much time getting our, ourselves inside the brains of millionaires <laughs> on a very frequent basis. <laughs> and that's what listeners can do every single day with podcasts yeah. like this one is giving back. And, and like you said, Marshall, it's absolutely free for everybody. So why not tap in on a regular I basis? Agree. That's awesome. Absolutely. Well, you mentioned Turning Point. Uh, that's one of your seminars, right? Yep. Okay. Yeah. So- our, 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 our core program is a two and a half day event called Turning Point. I've been teaching it for 34 years. Yep. And it does, it does three things. The uh, first thing it does is it turns up your wantingness. It's what you asked me about. Mm -hmm. Uh, I have kids and I want them to have the most amazing life. And so for me, I don't work. (laughs) I live my life in in a certain way and it allows me to give them a lifestyle that I never had that I want them to enjoy while also educating them on how to provide for themselves. Mm. That second piece is essential. The, uh, The other thing though is that what has to happen in order for you to allow yourself to turn up the wantingness is turning point also teaches you how to go inside of your own mind, understand what programs you hold, what truths you have inside your subconscious that actually aren't true, or maybe don't have to be true, or maybe don't work for you and reprogram your brain to get rid of those programs and put the proper programs in that will get the tasks that you need done done. The third thing it does is since everything we want, we don't have, and money cures most things. The third thing that it does is it lays down the foundation to help the attendee, you, the student, understand the language patterns, the skills of irresistible influence. Since everything you want that you don't have, you're likely going to get from somebody else. Mm -hmm. It will show you how to influence people to want to give you what you want and have them believe it was their idea. Mm -hmm. The best sales technique, huh? Yeah. And I I imagine this isn't isn't just done through just presentations on stage where they're sitting there taking notes. I mean, you're actually 
rewiring their brain throughout this whole process. Yeah, we have three uh, certain sessions where I put them in a certain state. And in that certain state, number one, teach them how to put themselves in that state. Also, though, put them into a certain future five years from now where they are living a certain life. They have certain relationships. They have certain wealth. They are certain millionaires. And what happens is that starts to change the receptors of the brain. And any thought sustained long enough creates an organic shift in the brain so they view the world differently. Once again, you know, there's one point where our president, Donald Trump, was a billion dollars in debt. And he's mm -hmm. walking along with his wife. And there's a homeless man on the street. And he says to his wife, that man is worth a billion dollars more than me because he likely has no debt. Mm. Yet, yet he's a billionaire, and that's in his DNA, and he knows that. So you know, whether it's a Donald Trump or a Richard Branson or a, any billionaire who's had fortunes and then had the fortunes threatened, they know who they are. The expression is, your first million is the most difficult one to make. Mm -hmm. Once you know you can do it, you can do it again and again. And I would subscribe to that. I would also add that the best thing to do is to skip the first million. Just get, get over it. Move beyond and accept the fact that you are a certain millionaire, even if the money has not yet been deposited in your bank account. That's powerful. I love that. All right, Marshall, where can folks go uh, check out that seminar, Turning Point, and all the other stuff that you have to offer? A great place to start is a, a short yet powerful place. It's the letter M, the letter P, the number two, and the letter M.com forward slash webinar. So it's the letter M, the letter P, the number two, letter M.com forward slash webinar. That is an event called the Missing Piece to Millions. And that webinar is actually, a, it's a 90 minute training where they can see me in action. They can see me demonstrate irresistible influence. I'll, I'll pull a random person up from the audience and they'll watch me sell them something they didn't even know they wanted. <laughs> and by the time I'm done, not only do they buy from me on the webinar, they can just watch it happen unfold in front of their eyes. They also will see me teach all these other things we've been talking about on this podcast. The, uh, the webinar was filmed live on three cameras, broadcast quality shoot at my palace in Las Vegas. So they'll get a chance to meet my bride. They'll get a chance to take a look at the lifestyle that I live and they'll learn a whole lot. Totally free. Uh, M P the number two, the letter M.com forward slash webinar, or to find out more about me, they can also go to silver S Y L V E R.com. S Y L V E R the spelling of my last name dot com mm -hmm. and they can find out more about me there too. Awesome. We're gonna link those in the show notes too for sure. So no one gets that messed up in those URLs. And and I will attest to the production of everything that you put out. It is so high quality, it's ridiculous. <laughs> Even even the you know the videos inside your mansion there, and you know everybody's sitting around the table or you know around the the, yep. the screen and stuff. It's cool, man. You're doing it right. It's really fun. So go check it out fun. for sure. Yeah, and we're gonna we're gonna catch you out in uh, Carl's bed pretty soon when when that thing's opened up. I want to see you out there. I would love yeah. that. Thank you, man. Well, I appreciate your time, uh, Matt. Anything else? No, I think we uh, covered a lot go. of ground. <laughs> All right, Marshall. Well, thank you awesome very much, gentlemen. and we'll talk soon. You're very welcome. All right, bye. Mm -hmm. Thanks, everybody, for listening to this episode of the Hustle and Flowchart podcast. Before taking the time to listen, we want to give you something a little bit special. Every single episode that we do, we actually have somebody on our team take notes. We basically have a Cliff's Notes version of every episode where you can go and find all of the tips and tactics that they laid out, all of the resources that they laid out. All the good stuff from this episode, we actually have a nice simple notes version that you can find on our website. So go to evergreenprofits.com, find this episode that you just listened to, and uh, give us your email address and we'll send you the notes. Thanks for listening.